Um, before I get started, maybe just a show of hands, how many people here currently or have ever worked on a project that's primarily Erlang? Have, have, have been. Okay, so that's a pretty good number. Okay, um, I, we'll come back to that later. All right, so um, this is me. My name is Todd Rezidek. I live outside of Denver, Colorado. I work at a company called SimpleBet, uh, which uses Elixir and machine learning uh, to build markets, micro markets for sports gaming. Um, I'm on the Hexcore team, and you can find me online at Super Simple. Um, all right, so this is kind of this is my story. So I think everybody has their own their own story, their own perspective on Elixir and Erlang and all the Beam technologies. So. It's definitely not prescriptive. Um, it's just based on like my personal journey in, in this ecosystem. Um, so when I first started using Elixir, this is essentially what I heard, is that Elixir is the solution to Erlang syntax. Um, and so uh, you know, the concept being that Erlang's VM is really awesome, concurrency model is great. The only problem is the syntax of the language itself is cumbersome, and so uh, we've created this new solution, and it's called Elixir. Um, so as I was learning Elixir, and you know, going through the standard library, um, I don't know if you've ever seen in the uh, like the function definitions. There is like the the braces that you can link to the source code, so it'll take you to GitHub, like the actual source of every function. And so, being curious as I am, uh, I started doing that. And you know, more often than I expected, I would see stuff like this. And so like this is actually in the Elixir string, um, string module, or I'm sorry, in the inter integer module. Uh, if you want to change an integer to a string, you know, we've written this great function in Elixir. And what does it do? It just delegates down into an er the Erlang standard library for that. Um, and as you go through Elixir code, you know, you see this kind of over and over again. And not like the majority of Elixir code, but definitely more than I expected. Um, and so this was my first hint that, well, this, this Erlang must be pretty cool. Like Elixir is really, really cool. But under the hood, like what is really going on? And it's, it looks like this. And so uh, yeah, so I, I you know, that, that really piqued my interest, I guess, in, in the Erlang language itself. Um, I already knew the virtual machine was really cool, um, but I was curious, like, wanted to form my own opinion, I guess, about Erlang syntax and if it's really, you know, as bad as, as people maybe have told me. So uh, for those of you who've never written any Erlang, uh, this is an example Erlang function. This is what the syntax looks like. Uh, so it is definitely different than you're used to if you were writing Elixir every day. But it is, uh, well, form your own opinion whether you think it's really all that bad or not. Uh, but now you can at least say, yes, I have read some Erlang code before. And I agree that it's horrible or disagree, don't think it's that bad. Um, so the, the purpose, well, there are several purposes of this talk. But one of them is sort of identify what I think are the problems with, our, uh, with the ecosystem so far. The first one being our approach. So, um, you know, we we marketed or mar Elixir was marketed as the solution to Erlang syntax, and so like, who is that immediately going to attract? It's going to attract people that tried Erlang, have a great appreciation for the virtual machine, but didn't really love the syntax or or something else about it, uh, which I honestly think it's probably a pretty small audience. Um, there's not that many Erlangers to begin with. And then if you take the subset of them uh, that love the virtual machine but hated the syntax, you, you've worked yourself down to a pretty small group. Um, and then all those people that have spent so many years investing their careers uh, and their livelihoods in Erlang, you're essentially offending them and saying, this, here's this thing you've just done for the last 10 years, and I think it's horrible. Um, and so we, we've, we fixed it for you. And you know, it, honestly, it just, for them, it doesn't need fixing. Um, and so you know, I think that was like the two main problems of, of the approach when initially marketing the Elixir language. Uh, and the result is you know, the people that had the most knowledge of Beam just aren't interested. Um, so you have people that 
you know, have worked in Beam five years, 10 years, 15 years, et cetera, and um, you're coming at them saying like, I've got this great Beam technology that fixes the syntax that Robert, Joe, it's Mike, whoever, that you created. And so they're like, well, great. I'm the person that, that knows everything about Beam, and I have no interest in helping you in Elixir because you're telling me that my project is, you know, is not great. Um, so you end up with these two parallel groups. And so we've got the Elixir group and the OTP side working sort of in parallel and eventually working on all the same problems. So um, Elixir being newer, it's probably working on solving problems that Erlang solved 10 years ago, 20 years ago, uh, without all that knowledge um, in the community to say, oh yes, we've done this and this is how we, we corrected that issue. Uh, this is how we optimize that thing. Uh, and then also adding new features and being, you know, Elixir is limited by what can be merged into OTP, so we're solving it in this creative workaround way, and OTP is trying to do new things, um, et cetera. So you've got a lot of wasted effort, a lot of smart people that you know, could, could do a lot together. Um, and it also just limited the, the growth of the community in general. Um, so that's, uh, I guess that's why I'm really excited to be at this conference in particular giving this talk, because I feel like more than any of the other Elixir conferences, um, we are, this conference attracts Erlangers and Elixirists like me that are curious or have an, a, an appreciation for Erlang. Um, so I'm really, really glad that all of you showed up today for this. Um, so the second problem that I've noticed in the Elixir community is a lot of us go way out of our way to avoid learning anything about Erlang. Um, and so this is, a, this is actually taken from the Erlang.org site, so the Getting Started Guides, but I think a lot of people miss this. So this you know, is directly from Jose's uh, lips to your ears. So Elixir discourages simply wrapping Erlang libraries in favor of directly interfacing with Erlang code. Uh, and this definitely resonates with me. Um, as somebody that's involved in our package management system especially, uh, this, this like really writes, like, uh, hits home for me. So it's time to have a tough talk. And it's about HCT poison. So um, I apologize, but so anybody that's working in Elixir or Phoenix I'm sure you're very familiar with this. Uh, we use HTT poison to make HTTP requests. Um, the function looks like this. And so you hit the request function, you give it five arguments in this order, uh, and that's what makes HTTP calls. Now, what some people don't bother to, to investigate is how this works. Um, so HTT poison has a, a direct dependency on Hackney. Um, Hackney is not part of the standard library in Erlang, but it's an Erlang library. Uh, instead. So if you look at Hackney, this is what the function looks like. So also has five arguments. The big difference here being that the payload or the body and the headers are flipped in position. Um, so you have a, a dependency, poison, HTT poison that you're using that has itself a dependency called Hackney. And the benefit for bringing in all that extra code, uh, that library into your uh, Elixir application rather than just bringing in Hackney itself um, is this. So this is what uh, essentially what um, HTT poison delegates to. So when you hit that request method, it hits this do request function, um, sorry, function. And what does it do? It just essentially puts the arguments in the right order and delegates it out to Hackney. So again, this is what we're looking at. Um, So again, like I said, as, a, as somebody that's really into package management, what disturbs me about this is we have a library that is essentially protecting you uh, from the crippling effects of having to hit the colon uh, to refer to a module. And this is so valuable that it has been downloaded 13.7 million times for the benefit of doing that. Um, and even worse, there are, what, 1,200, almost 1,300 dependencies that use HTT poison as a transitive dependency. So if you are bringing in any of these, you are getting HTT poison as a side effect, which is then giving you Hackney. Um, 
And so that, to me, is even more disturbing and makes me feel like this. All right, so that's one rant. Let's talk about crypto. Not this kind, this kind. So if you've done any hashing in Elixir, um, you've probably seen or written something like this. So this is an example of something that's uh, available to you in the uh, Erlang standard library, but is not available like directly in the Elixir standard library. Um, hashing never was brought over, so you, you know, want to make a SHA-256 uh, hash of something, of a quote-unquote secret here, you're going to be doing this. Now, there's a library out there called Xcrypto, which prevents you again from having to hit the colon um, to refer to module and essentially gives you this. Uh, so for the benefit of bringing in this library, instead of getting back an error, you get back an error tuple. And that's, so now you're, you're maintaining, you have brought in code into your application, this X crypto library, that now you're in charge of maintaining, making sure that it's updated, making sure that it's patched. Um, you know, if there's any vulnerabilities in it, now you have vulnerabilities in your application. Uh, so you've opened yourself up to those potential problems, and in exchange, your error is now an error tuple. Um, and so this, this library has about 200,000 downloads to move the error into a tuple for you. Um, yes, this is, this is my rant, but uh, I think this is a problem in our community. So um, in my opinion, and again, just my opinion, is an Elixir, an Elixir wrapper for an Erlang library should be opinionated. So I think it's totally fine to wrap what is an Erlang API in an Elixir API if it's opinionated. So if you're saying, uh, being prescriptive and saying, I expect, let's take ETS for example, um, I want to use ETS this way, I want to interface with it exactly this way uh, and form some very strong opinions in your library. I think that's actually a very valid reason to do this. If all you're doing is changing errors to error tuples, um, or preventing, you know, flipping the, the arguments of something, I would question, you know, the validity of doing something like that or really the value that it gives to our community. Um, all right, problem three. Uh, to be great in Elixir, you must know at least some Erlang. And so this was a, this is a lesson I think that was drilled into me um, by a programmer named uh, Brian Paxton. And... Uh, it, it, honestly, I think it's very, very, very correct. So it, um, this, is, again, is from the Elixir Lang website. So it says, as you grow more proficient in Elixir, you may want to explore the Erlang Standard Library Reference Manual in more details. Um, I think it should say, you will want to explore the Erlang Standard Library. So I'm going to give you some very, very good reasons why you should do this. So there are features that exist in the Erlang Standard Library that you don't know about if you're an Elixir programmer. Uh, the binary modules. So if you're dealing with binary data that's not UTF-8 encoded, you can do that. Um, formatted text output. So if you look at like printf, for instance, you have access to that in Erlang. ETs and DETs. So how many people here use ETs or have used ETs or DETs? Yeah, so awesome. You're Erlangers already. Um, so this is built into the standard library. A digraph module. So this one, is, uh, this one is really cool. So it contains functions for dealing with directed graphs, uh, built of vertices and edges. And this is all in, you have this in your application now by virtue of installing Erlang, you have this already. Um, so just to uh, kind of explain that or go into a little bit more detail. So directed graphs uh, in mathematics or more specifically in graph theory, a directed graph or a digraph is a graph made up of a set of vertices uh, connected by edges where the edges have a direction associated with them. So uh, this is a simple diagram of a directed graph. So if you want to be able to get from one point to another point and find a, a method to get there, um, you can put those into a directed graph and you essentially have a, you know, what is a, essentially a very simple graph database without having to install any extra libraries, without having to um, you know, spin up an AWS service just for this. So if you have um, a simple set of problems that could benefit by the use of a directed graph, just go into the Elixir or the Erlang standard library, you've got access to all that. 
It's all about the edges. Edges, edges, edges. Um, so continuing on that theme, math module. So um, if you want to do any advanced math in, in Elixir or in a Beam application, you're going to want to drop into Erlang. So the way I think about it is if you've you got your iPhone calculator and you're holding it in portrait mode, that's Elixir's math API. When you spin it, you get scientific calculator, that's Erlang. Um, so think about that. Anytime you're going to spin your, your phone for calculation, go into Erlang to do that. Uh, the Q module, also very, very cool. I'm sure there's a great reason why this is built into the standard library. So if you need a simple first in, first out Q, um, Erlang has it built in. So you don't have to implement your own FIFO Q. You don't have to bring in any libraries. You don't even have to think about it. Just colon Q, you're all set. And it's got a bunch of functions to be able to work with it. Um, random module, we've all seen this. Rand uniform, very, very common. Uh, and also like any compression tools. So uh, zip and zlib are built into the Erlang standard library. Um, this may or may not be something you ever need. This is something that we use a lot in, uh, in the hex world uh, to move big files around. Um, also, if anybody saw Jose's talk at ElixirConf last year, uh, he kind of spoke about how the Elixir, the features in Elixir are sort of coming to an end. It's sort of feature complete. And his future uh, involves going deeper and deeper into the stack. So um, in this case, like further to the right. So he was saying that, you know, he's probably not going to be in the Elixir or maybe even in the Erlang world, but more on like core Erlang kernel side of things in the next few years. Um, and so, you know, up to this point, a lot of people have contributed to Elixir Lang. Um, as it's feature complete, there's going to be fewer opportunities or fewer needs to contribute into that, and we're going to find ourselves working, contributing to our language by working farther to the right like Jose is. Um, one example, I think, is telemetry. So uh, telemetry is, you've probably all seen this one, right? Okay. Uh, <laughs> so telemetry was announced at ElixirConf 2018, I think. Um, by Chris McCord, and it was originally designed as an Elixir project. And then shortly thereafter, um, it was decided that in order to be useful for the entire Beam community, they were going to scrap that, rewrite it all in Erlang so that you know, everybody in Beam could use the same telemetry libraries. Um, and so as, you're, as our ecosystem is growing out, I think we're going to see more and more of this stuff where you know, it's great to add things to Elixir, but we're looking at contributing, finally contributing back in a big way to the OTP side of things. And so um, making contributions uh, to our ecosystem is going to involve you writing Erlang. Um, I know at least one of us here has recently done something yeah, like this. Um, so all right. Hopefully I've convinced you by this point that you should look into the Erlang standard library or at least keep an open mind to it. If you have not, I'm going to remind you that it is from Sweden like many, many cool things, like this band here. OK, anybody know who this is? Yes. Ghost. Ghost. OK, thank God. Last time I gave this talk, not a single person. All right. Uh, you're Swedish. OK. So for those who are not familiar, this is a really great metal band from Sweden, as most metal, great metal bands are. Uh, and they've actually won a Grammy. OK, other cool things from Sweden, Koenigsegg. Very cool cars. And th <laughs> this guy. All right. So how do I get started? OK, Todd, you've talked me into it. Where do I start? Start with some of these books. So uh, Learn You Some Erlang uh, by Fred A. Bear and Adopting Erlang by Fred A. Bear and Tristan Slaughter are both available online for free. Um, those are open source projects. So you can start today at no cost. There's also some other great books, um, Elix or Erlang and OTP in Action and Concurrent Programming in Erlang um, that were written. So these are like great resources on getting started. Um, so in our community, uh, we also have a Slack channel. So erlanger.slack.com, great place to go in. You'll see some, some names, maybe the people that raised their hands earlier. You'll see them in this Slack. So if you're getting started and have questions, it's a great resource. Um, one other thing I see a lot of is uh, local meetups are called the, you know, Austin Elixir Meetup, right? Um, 
If you're running one of those meetups, try incorporating Erlang into the name. So Austin, Elixir, and Erlang meetup. Um, I think you might find that it attracts more of the Erlang crowd into your, into your meetup. And I always find those people are some of the more interesting people to talk to at the meetups. They have like a whole different, they're coming at all of our problems from different angles. And sometimes they can um, shed some historical light on why things in Elixir work certain ways. Uh, and make some Erlanger friends. So all those people that raise their hands, maybe go introduce yourself after, after this talk. All right. So my hope is that after this talk, Erlang and Elixir are like this. So we're, if you look at all these kitties and bunnies, they, they're like doppelgangers. They actually look a lot alike. They're both really cute in different ways. And these, in this case, they're, they're very good friends. All right. Uh, so thanks everybody for being here and thanks to uh, my employer SimpleBet for, for letting me come out here and give this talk today. Um, so we've got if anybody has a question they want to pop. One question? We've got room for three questions. Oh, three questions. Okay. Or comments or compliments. Way in the back. I have a quick question around the, like a documentation of all the oh, especially yes. not not necessarily like a standard Erlang library, but like a Erlang library documentation. Okay. Like I know EP four A or something is coming, but what is the online documentation? Like a hex PM has XDoc is like a standard like Elixir documentation. Yeah. And what about Elixir? And the second question is around how can is there like any like best practice to have like a write Erlang and provide Elixir like a uh, interface easily like a uh, telemetry is doing there, right? Like, or is it, is that a better way to like, do that or like a uh, just write Erlang? Um, <laughs> so let me start with the first question first about documentation. Thanks for bringing that up, by the way. That's a really good point. So um, I think there are, so there's two problems. One is, is very solvable and one is not. So if you look at some Erlang libraries, uh, there's no documentation. So the code is self-documenting. And there's really very little we can do about that other than putting pressure on the maintainers to add documentation or to accept pull requests for that. Uh, so that one I don't think we can solve. But um, with the new EEP48, um, so I don't know if this was talked about yesterday, but uh, there, is, there is a group that is the XDoc team that is working on being able to parse uh, Erlang documents through XUnit's parser. And so the goal being that you will be able to look at Erlang documents in the same exact format that you're used to with Elixir documents. Um, and so as soon as is OTP 23 is released and that's merged into master, they'll be able to continue their work. So I would suspect by the end of 2020, um, Erlang docs are going to look exactly like Elixir docs. Um, so I think that is, a, that is very, very eminent. And the OTP community has really embraced the idea that their documentation could improve. I would also add to that that if you're coming from any other stack besides Elixir, the Erlang docs are, are really on par with R doc or Java docs, et cetera. Like Elixir docs are just so great that if you're used to that, everything seems less. Um, but if, if you're really doing like a apples to apples comparison of like other programming languages, it's, it's actually very, like there's actually a lot of parity there. Um, as far as, as the libraries, I think there's always going to be interfaces that give you Elixir APIs to those. Um, so I don't have a strong opinion. Like I kind of express what my opinion is on that, whether you should write the library in Erlang and just have people access it through uh, the colon syntax in Erlang versus having uh, some sort of an intermediary. So I, I don't want to, I'd say it's on a case by case basis. It makes sense sometimes, it makes, doesn't make sense other times. Do you have an example of an Erlang or an Elixir library that did an opinionated reconfiguration of an Erlang resource um, and did it right? Did it right? Uh, um, I mean, that's all a matter of opinion. There's a, there is a library called, I think it's just called Etz, uh, that was written by Mike Bins in the Elixir community, which I think is, is an example of a, an opinionated way of, of wrapping uh, 
uh, an Erlang library at in this case. So for someone who, like me who just kind of is more of Elixir hobbyists, um, you're talking about like Hackney is not part of the standard library. So you, how do you pull that in? How do you pull um, Erlang libraries like that into your into your as a dependency? Yeah. So um, I mean, you already are. It's just defined as a transitive dependency. So you can just pull it in in your mix file, um, just like anything else. Um, yeah, I. I I'll I will i have to show you the syntax to it. It's it's very well documented if you just go to hex pm. Um, so as right. somebody who doesn't mind Erlang syntax, actually likes it, um, what why why should I learn Elixir? I oh, I know that wasn't your intent, but I thought you know maybe there's something in Elixir that's really great that I should get that's super a, psyched about. No, well that's a good point. There is um. There are some abstractions, I think, uh, gen, gen server abstractions, for instance, uh, flow, gen stage, et cetera, like are some of the examples that come to mind um, that, are, that are making certain things easier to do. So I think in that sense, Elixir is, is good for that. Um, our package manager is the best, so I would say. <laughs> But that's a different talk. That's Bizarro Todd will give that talk of why, why Erlangers should be interested in Elixir. All right. All right. Well, th thanks very much. Thank you. All right.